There are some odd laws that are still on the books today in certain states. Let me read you a handful of these. Young girls are never allowed to walk a tightrope in Wheeler, Mississippi, unless it's in a church. In Blackwater, Kentucky, tickling a woman under her chin with a feather duster while she's in church service carries a penalty of $10 and one day in jail. If she's pretty gents, the fine and the time might be worth it. No one can eat unshelled roasted peanuts while attending church in Danha, Oregon. In Honey Creek, Iowa, no one is permitted to carry a slingshot to church except the policeman. No citizen in Lee Creek, Arkansas, is allowed to attend church in any red-colored garment. Swinging a yo-yo in church or anywhere in public on the Sabbath is prohibited in Studley, Virginia. Turtle races are not permitted within 100 yards of a local church at any time in Slaughter, Louisiana. Some laws are just loony. In Jesus' day, the Pharisees were clinging to silly laws that placed the traditions of men above the word of God. Turn with me, please, to Luke chapter 6. And you might ask, what are traditions? A tradition is something that is simply handed down from one generation to the next that is expected to be kept. And can I ask you, as you're turning to Luke chapter 6, which traditions have been handed down to you that are not biblical in nature and that conflict with the word of God. Let's think about that for just a moment. But may I ask you this more important question, just leading into the scripture reading. What should you do when tradition clashes with the word of God? What do you do? Luke chapter 6, let me read to you verses 1 through 5. Now it happened on the second Sabbath after the first that he went through the grain fields and his disciples plucked the heads of grain and ate them, rubbing them in their hands. And some of the Pharisees said to them, why are you doing what is not lawful to do on the Sabbath? But Jesus answering them said, have you not even read this? What David did when he was hungry, he and those who were with him how he went into the house of God, took and ate the showbread, and also gave some to those with him, which is not lawful for any but the priest to eat. And he said to them, The Son of Man is also Lord of the Sabbath. Let's pray together. Father, tradition, things handed down. Father, there can be good traditions, but there can also be anti-biblical ones. So, Father, I pray today that we would, by your spirit, become a discerning people. Your spirit would help us to discern the things that have been maybe handed down to us, that we're tempted to hand down to the next generation that doesn't match the word of God. And today, that very thing would be corrected. I just thank you for your son, the Lord Jesus, and how he is to be exalted above tradition. May we exalt him today in our sermon, I ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Dr. Luke, in particular, seems to take note to the Sabbath day in which Jesus does these various activities. Could it be, since Luke was a doctor, that he had opposition from the Jewish community when he tried to practice his medicine on the Sabbath? Did some of them maybe consider it to be work as he went to their homes and maybe helped with a diagnosis of a problem or to give some kind of remedy, I wonder. But Luke in particular takes note to the fact that these activities happen on the Sabbath day. Now, the word Sabbath itself just simply means rest. Jesus had now taken a walk through the grain fields on the Sabbath. Fascinating to understand Jewish tradition. The oral law. Back in the day, going back to Jesus' day, the rabbis began to come up with all these different regulations that, if you will, they added to the word of God. 
They all got compiled by about the second century, the end of uh, about, about 8200, actually. And what they did is they compiled all these laws and put them in a book called the Talmud. And within the Talmud, the first part of that is called the Mishnah. And let me tell you, from the Mishnah, you have Sota, chapter 5 and verse 3. And you're saying, okay, what's in chapter 5 and verse 3? It was just simply this, that no one could walk more than 2,000 cubits on any Sabbath day. Now, first of all, you have to ask the question, what is a cubit, right? A cubit would be the distance, if you had a king, because he was the standard, that would go from the middle finger, the top, down to the elbow. Usually consisted about 18 inches. So in this particular case, the Jews could not walk, according to the Mishnah, more than just over a half a mile on the Sabbath. And can you envision Jesus as he's walking through the grain fields, having some of the scribes and the Pharisees follow him along, with a Stanley tape measure in her hand because they want to designate that he went maybe 2,000 feet and six inches so they could accuse him guilty of breaking their tradition by the way which they equated with the word of God. This is what Jesus is dealing with. And how do they attack him? Guilt by association. And his disciples plucked the heads of grain and ate them, rubbing them in their hands. And again, according to their tradition, they were working because the plucking and the rubbing to them was like harvesting and threshing. But what's our standard, everybody? It's the word of God. And if you turn to Deuteronomy chapter 23, and you don't need to look there, but in verses 24 and 25, it gives the privilege to people who are traveling and who are hungry to do exactly what Jesus' disciples did here. But we have the Pharisees now making an appeal not to the word of God, but to their tradition. Because in verse 2, and some of the Pharisees said to them, why are you doing what is not lawful to do on the Sabbath? These people were cold legalists. Actually, in the Mishnah, there were 39 categories showing how people could not work at that time. Can you imagine? Isn't it simple enough to say, on the Sabbath, you shall not labor? But to come up with 39 categories of rules and regulations that you deem that you have to impose upon the people. This is what was being imposed upon Jesus' disciples and by way of guilt of association being thrust upon him as well. But what does Jesus do? He does what all of us should do. And he makes the appeal to the word of God. And his question expects a yes answer. And how does Jesus answer their question, by the way? With a question. That's the Jewish way you do this. But Jesus answering them said, have you not even read this, what David did when he was hungry? He and those who were with him, how he went into the house of God, took and ate the showbread and also gave some to those with him, which is not lawful for any but the priest to eat. In the holy place would have been a table in the northern part of the holy place. And on the table weekly were placed 12 fresh loaves of bread. It was a sit there most likely representing how God would provide for the 12 tribes of Israel. Now, in heathen practices, guess why they set out food? So they could feed their gods. This wasn't the case with the true God of Israel. The 12 loaves were there, representing the 12 tribes, showing that, if you will, in the future, the bread of life would be the one who would make provision for the people. But what does David do? He's not a priest in a technical sense, but he shows up and he has need. But was the law given, the minutiae, the detail, in order to hurt people, to keep them away from what is good? No. So what did David do? He took of the bread, and he gave it to those who were with him, and they ate. And Jesus is simply saying, don't you even know what the word of God says? That God doesn't give the law in order to keep people from having needs met, but to meet needs. Jesus lays them out at this point. 
And may I say to you, here's our first point, and take this to heart. Honor God's word above man's tradition. Honor God's word above man's tradition. Remember I asked you earlier, what are some of the traditions passed down to you? Some families, you know, there's the rabbit's foot that gets passed down from generation to generation because you need to be lucky. In other families, you get little medallions or medals and said if you wear this or put it in your car, it'll protect you, right? Tradition, things that are handed down. But we would say in those cases, contrary to the word of God because there's no such thing as luck. We have a God of providence who rules the universe. We don't need a St. Christopher medal around our neck because our God is our protector and he is with us 24-7. So we need to evaluate all things by the word of God and always hold God's word above the traditions of men. A farmer was driving his truck down the road and a little boy spotted him and yelled out, Sir, what's in your truck? And he said, fertilizer. Uh, we're going to Lancaster, Pennsylvania, and if they fertilize the fields, we will know it because it's evident at that point. So the little boy says, sir, what are you doing with the fertilizer? And he said, we're going to put it on our strawberries. And the little boy looked and he said, sir, I'm really sorry you don't live in my house because we put sugar and cream on ours. <laughs> Be careful what you put on the word of God. Be cautious to things that you add to God's word. It's sufficient in and of itself and doesn't need anything added to it. Matthew chapter 15. Let me illustrate this for you by another passage. Would you turn here, please? Matthew chapter 15. You will find throughout, particularly the synoptic gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, whereby the religious community is keeping to the tradition of the elders. Those things that were orally disseminated from generation to generation and later on got written down that they said it was equal to the word of God. In Matthew chapter 15, then the scribes and Pharisees who were from Jerusalem, this is an official delegation, came to Jesus saying, why do your disciples transgress the tradition of the elders? For they do not wash their hands when they eat bread. Now, we're not talking sanitary issues here. There were certain ways that they were supposed to wash in order that they would be considered clean. Again, the tradition of the elders. Jesus answered and said to them, why do you also transgress the commandment of God because of your tradition? See, where does Jesus bring them back to? the authority structure of the word of God, verse 4. For God commanded, saying, Honor your father and your mother, and he who curses father and mother, let him be put to death. But what did these self-righteous scribes and Pharisees do? Look at verse 5. But you say, Whoever says to his father and mother, Whatever profit you might have received from me is a gift to God. In Mark chapter 7 and verse 11, the word Corbin is used. And the word Corbin just simply means gift of God. In other words, what these religious leaders were doing was saying all of our financial ownings, they are dedicated to God. Therefore, we can't spend those assets to care for our elderly parents. Is that hypocrisy? So what does Jesus appeal to? Honor your mother and father. And can I ask you, does that only pertain to little children taking respect to their parents? No. We are always to honor mother and father. And even if that means costing us something for their future care, then that is what we do because that's one of the great commandments. Is it not? It's the fifth commandment to honor your father and mother. So what does Jesus do here? He calls him out. Look at verse 6. Then he need not honor his father and mother. See, by virtue of their tradition... They had circumvented caring for their parents. Thus you have made the commandment of God of no effect by your tradition. And he says, hypocrites. Well did Isaiah prophesy about you saying, these people draw near to me with their mouth and honor me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. And in vain they worship me, teaching as doctrines the commandments of men. Wow. You see what they've done? Keep in mind Ephesians chapter 6, my friends. Children, 
Obey your parents in the Lord. Let's step back for just a moment. If you recall from last week's sermon, I, I talked to you about submission. But what's the background to submission? Being spirit-filled. Remember in Ephesians 5.18, do not be drunk with wine, in which is excess, but be filled with the Spirit, speaking to one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your hearts to the Lord, giving thanks always for all things to God the Father, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, and then it said in verse 21, submitting to one another in the fear of God. In other words, when you are spirit-filled, you will be joyful, you will be thankful, and you will be submissive. That word submissive there means to arrange under. It's the same word that will be used in Ephesians 5.22 for wives submitting to the husbands. But then we come to Ephesians chapter 6. After we have the wives by the power of the Spirit being under their husband's authority, and then we have the husbands loving their wives as Christ loved the church by the Spirit's power, now we talk to children. And what are children told to do? Obey. Now it's a different Greek word than what is used back in Ephesians 5, 21 and 22. That is the word in Ephesians 6, 1, hupa akuo, literally to hear under. So what are the children to do to hear or listen under their parents? Is it a biological function? How many kids, if you will, in one ear and out the other? Is that what it means to hear under? No. It means that you carry out what your parents have told you to do. Children, obey your parents and the Lord. And notice what he says, for this is right. Don't we live in a world of wrong? Aren't we living where no one gives a rip for parents and there's no respect or honor given today? Honor your mother and your father, which is the first commandment with promise. Where does Paul appeal to? I'll tell you, the Ten Commandments. The fifth commandment. Honor your mother and father, which is the first commandment with a specific promise. The second command also had a promise, but it was general. And what is the promise? That it may be well with you and that you may live long on the earth. Now think about it. We have the scribes and the Pharisees who claim to know the word of God like no one else and to be practicing it. And they're throwing their parents under the bus because of their tradition. See, my friends, God is so interested in not only you knowing his word, oh yes, but also doing his word. How are we at implementing all that God has given us to do. That's what we need to contemplate here. So our first point, honor. God's word above man's tradition. And in number two, honor Jesus as God above man's tradition. Honor Jesus as God because he is God above man's tradition. And in verse five, back here in Luke chapter six, and he said to them, the son of man, is also Lord of the Sabbath. You remember the expression, son of man? It's Jesus' favorite designation for himself. It appeared first back in Luke 5 and verse 24. There he says the son of man has authority or power to do what? To forgive sin. And now we see that the son of man, he is also Lord of the Sabbath. That's who he is. Why did God create the Sabbath? Why did he give Israel that time of rest? And may I say by way of implication, what is today all about? Why should we even be here? What should our attitude be as we come in a door? Seriously, what is it? I am going through the checklist and I'm going to tell God this week, God, I've read my Bible each day. Check. God, I prayed this week. Check. God, I went to church on Sunday. Check. And then, God, now you owe me because on the checklist, I've made three checks. Correct? No. Isaiah chapter 58. Would you go back there with me for just a moment, please? I want you to see what today Eve is all about. Since Jesus Christ is raised from the dead, it should be a celebration. Because Jesus Christ has conquered death, you and I should walk through the doors of the church and go, Wow! Jesus is alive. He's conquered death. No problem that I have is equal to the power that he possesses. 
Regardless of whatever my circumstances in life or even in death, it doesn't matter. And that is why we say the Lord is risen. He is risen indeed. And remember when the people went to the tomb, those ladies, early in the morning on that, on that early Sunday morning? And what did the angel have to say to them in, in Mark chapter 16? Stop being afraid. Why? Because Jesus is risen from the dead. Do we understand how much today is a day of celebration and a day of delight and a day of Christian partying? Come on, what's everybody been doing on Friday night and Saturday night? I'll tell you what they've been doing. They've been going out and getting their buzz on because they don't want reality. And if they have a few too many, then they can just deny what's going on around them and feel good for a while. What about us today? You got a celebration going on in your heart? Or is it I'm going to bed late on Saturday night and I'm going to come into church dragging and I'm going to go, I'm going to have my checklist done so I can come back to God on Monday and say, God bless me because I went through the motions. I pray you're not going through the motions. I pray there's an enthusiasm in your life. I pray that there's a fire in your belly. I pray there's an excitement in your walk because you know the risen Christ. Amen? Amen? Look at this in Isaiah chapter 58, verse 13. For a people who were going through the motions and were fasting, but not for God, if you turn away your foot from the Sabbath, from doing your pleasure on my holy day, ah, your pleasure. And, you know, one of the things that will discourage the pastors on my, more than anything else, and I'm just telling you what it is, it's sparse attendance. You have people come one week, you don't see them for two. You see some folks for one week, you don't see them for three weeks. And it's just like they don't even miss a beat. And this has happened in churches all across the country because it's just become an option whether we worship the Lord, but if there's anything else that is going on on Sunday, we got a family reunion going on, or I just have to watch the fight the night before, so I'm not getting to bed on time, or this, that, or the other thing. It just becomes an option and drudgery. That isn't what this is all about, my friends. It's about celebration. It's about a relationship with our God who conquered death. It's about a relationship with the one who has taken our sins and buried them in the depths of the sea. Whoever lives to make intercession for us, it's about coming and meeting with him and letting this world know that my God is a priority above everything else. And if he's not, then you're not worthy to be his disciple according to the words of the Lord Jesus Christ. If you turn away your foot from the Sabbath, from doing your pleasure on my holy day, and call the Sabbath a delight, a delight or a luxury, a luxury? Huh. Just going and worshiping God is putting you in the lap of luxury? Oh, yeah. The holy day of the Lord honorable, and shall honor him, not doing your own ways, nor finding your own pleasure, nor speaking your own words. That's where we need revival in America. That Sunday again becomes a holy day to God where we celebrate the resurrected Christ and we make that a priority. And I'm telling you, we are failing, my friends, across the nation because we're just telling our children, hey, listen, I know I'm called a parent, but whatever you feel like doing when it comes to worship, that's what you do. You know, whatever happened to train up a child in the way he should go, and then when he is old, he will not depart from it. Where does it come to us doing what is difficult, training the next generation so that they will know what to do? We have fallen off in America, and we're paying for it dearly with our families. And we're looking and saying, oh, we're going to blame the other party, whether it's Democrat or, or Republican or Independent, and we're forgetting to look in the mirror. We're forgetting that we haven't made God a priority and a delight, that we're not celebrating him because we're too busy doing our own pleasure and doing our own things, and maybe I'll come back in two, three, or four weeks from now. Verse 14, then you shall delight. We saw earlier on the same form of the word in verse 13, delight. Here, 
we have the verb, and it's the idea of being pampered. It's used actually in Deuteronomy 28, verse 56, of a delicate or a pampered woman. Now, if I said, ladies, let's do something really exciting today. Here's some money. Go to the spa. Get your nails done. Let them do your, let them do your hair. You get all excited, and you would call that a delight, and you'd call it fun. But you know what a delight is? Meeting with the people of God, worshiping the true God. Do you know what a delight is? Understanding how we have been redeemed and our sin is removed and we have heaven looking ahead of us and our almighty God is going to reward us for everything we've ever done for him. How could you not want to run through the doors and say, here I am, Lord, let's meet, let's engage, speak to me. I'm here because I just want to meet with you. That's what today is all about. But the folks made it a labor in order to worship God. And they started adding all these rules and regulations. So therefore, the people started going through their checklist in order to please God. And God goes, that's not the kind of checklist I like. Come back with me, please, to Luke chapter 6. We honor Jesus. Why? He's the Son of Man who forgives sin and has authority to do so. That's chapter 5 and verse 24 of Luke. But in chapter 6, he's Lord of the Sabbath. And can I point out to you, there is a tradition we need to keep today. And do you know what that tradition is? Turn over to 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 and I'll tell you what it is. And I would believe that if today we'd repent as a people when we've sinned, when we haven't made God a priority in our living and our giving, when we haven't allowed Jesus Christ to be the Lord of our lives as he really is rightfully deserves, if we would repent from that and tell God we are sincerely sorry, we have grieved your spirit because we have not made you a priority, and I seek your humble forgiveness, but from this moment onward, I'm going to change things. God would start to pick it up and work with you right where you're at, my dear friend, right where you're at today. He's that kind of God. Even when a wicked king like Ahab repented and was sorry for his sin, even God showed mercy to a wicked man like that. How much more people that want to know the real God? And walk with him. In 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, come down to verse 15 with me, please. And let me tell you the tradition that we ought to keep. Therefore, brethren, two words in English, one in Greek, and it's an imperative, it's in the present tense, which means keep on doing this. Stand fast. In what? We'll see in a moment. And then your second key verb, also a present tense, command or imperative, hold. What do we hold on to? What do we stand fast in? The traditions which you were taught. In other words, when Paul was with the Thessalonians and instructed them about the word of God, keep it, stand on it. And then as you read the word of God for yourself, keep it. Stand upon it and don't let anybody move you. A double-minded or double-souled man is unstable in some of his ways, all of his ways. We need to understand what our priorities are, that when Christ calls us, we put our hands to the plow and we don't look back. It's not as if now that we've been called and the one has died for us and he has bought us, that he expects for us to give him just lip service. Or we expect, he expects us to give him partial service. Oh, no, my friends. It's everything all the time. It's what he requires. So what do we need to do? Hold the traditions which you were taught, whether by word or our epistle. Can I ask you honestly today, are you standing on the word of God? Are you holding fast to what has been entrusted to you? In essence, are you doing what Almighty God has given for you to do. Let's close it out with Psalm 119. Would you turn back there about the middle of your Bibles? Psalm 119 in verse 97. Do you love God's word? Do I love God's word more than I do love preaching God's word? Do we love obeying God's word? 
Do we love memorizing God's word? Do we love meditating upon God's word? Do we love hearing God's word? And we're going, I can't get enough of the word of God. In Psalm 119, beginning in verse 97, let me tell you someone who has a heart for God. Oh, how I love your law. It is my meditation all the day. Is it? You know, the ladies are going to begin uh, memorizing Psalm 145. I was over here yesterday, and I just read it aloud. And, oh, it's a profound. Psalm 145 about the attributes of God and his ways being past finding out. You know, all three of my sons, when they got to a certain age, I assembled a group of men around them that I respected, and I had them bring tools, whatever the man's trade was. And then to take a biblical lesson from that tool, and give instruction to my three sons. And it's exactly what they did. And I remember speaking to all three of my sons from Psalm 145 and verse 3, because it talks about God and his way essentially being past finding out. In other words, if I take all my moments of all my life and focus on just knowing God, I will never get to the end of him. I'm only scratching the surface. Do you recognize that? I'm 52. And I'm sitting here, and I've learned a lot. I have, but I don't know anything. And I'm thinking, Lord, if you keep me at this for 20 years actively, I'm going to have nothing really done overall because there's so much about you not only to know, but then to communicate to others. But can I tell you something? I love the Word of God. I love my God. He's so good. Notice, oh, how I love your law. It is my meditation all the day. You, through your commandments, make me wiser than my enemies, for they are ever with me. I have more understanding than all my teachers. Why? For your testimonies are my meditation. Wouldn't you love to know more than your teachers? Meditate on God's word. Psalm 19, 100. I understand more than the ancients. And notice these, if you will, five words. Because I keep your precepts. Can I ask you today, are you keeping the word of God? Everything that you have heard since you've come into the doors of this church, whether six months or six years or 16 or 26 years ago, are you keeping it? Are you doing it? See, what the psalmist says is the reason he had more understanding than the ancients was because he was doing the word of God. See, some people love, my friends, to study it. They do. I and mean, they can spend hours studying it. But you talk to a passage like, wife, submit to your husband. Or a passage like, husband, love your wife. Lay down your life for her in the way Christ loved down the church. Love the church. And all of a sudden, you know, it's... Uh, do we really love God? If so, we will love his word. And if so, we will keep his commandments. For this is the love of God, that we keep his commandments, and his commandments are not burdensome. Can I ask you today, what is it that you haven't been keeping? Would you bow your heads and would you tell God what you haven't been doing but you need to enact? And if you haven't been in the Word as you should, and the Word in you, would you tell them you're going to make it a priority because you want to come to love the Word of God? And then if there are some traditions that you have placed above or even equal to the Word of God, would you confess that as sin today and tell God that's got to go and the Word of God is supreme? And it doesn't matter who I offend in the process if I'm obeying you and pleasing you. Because God's word, Jesus offended a lot of people. He said some tough things to them in John 6, 66, and many of his disciples walked with them no more. Do you love God? And do you love his word? And are you doing his word? Would you tell him?